Good morning, Foothill Church. My name is Jeff Terrell. I'm a covenant partner here, uh, and I volunteer with Tech in the back and with uh, Foothill Kids. Yeah, woohoo! All right. Love worshiping with you this morning. Today's scripture is found in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no, not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. This is God's word. You may be seated. I remember when I was a kid... Uh, I was maybe 10 or 11 years old, and my dad had passed away. And I was asking my mom some questions. Uh, I think that generally a lot of kids do this, or pe- we just do this when people pass. But I asked my mom, like, hey, by the way, like, what's our family history? Like, what's going on here? Like, who are we related to? Uh, you, know, what, what's our, you know, what's our culture? What's our ethnicity? And it, it's during that time, that conversation with my mom, where she shared, she's like, actually, well, my mom was half Cherokee. And I was like, what? I didn't know this. Like, why are you waiting till now to tell me that, that, that I'm Cherokee? I just, I'm like, I'm full Cherokee at this point, right? I'm full Cherokee. You didn't tell me this. And I mean, this is the time of uh, Dances with Wolves, uh, Last of the Mohicans, Indian in the Cupboard. And I was like, okay, <laughs> this is my identity. This is who I am. And I'm no joke, I started collecting eagle figurines. I probably had 20 or 30 eagles, yeah, because it's true. Some of you have seen them, okay? I, I made homemade bows and arrows. I, I, uh, I, I let my hair grow long. I could put it in a ponytail. I was walking around barefoot everywhere. This is not a joke. My feet were disgusting. And I adopted this new identity. I didn't, I didn't care if I was 1% Cherokee. I, 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 I was going to adopt it. Um, now, actually, I, I don't know if this is even true. <laughs> um, I guess a lot of parents in the 80s and 90s, for whatever reason, told their kids that they're somehow related to some Indian tribe somewhere. And so, I, I don't know. But, but, but this curiosity about our roots follows us long into our adulthood, though, right? Um, that's why we have 23andMe. That's why we have Ancestry.com. So we can spit in a tube and find out what are we? What are we, right? And why are we so curious about our roots? Um, I think some of us, we might say, well, I want to find that long-lost family member. Uh, Some of us want to find out if we're related to royalty or to Abraham Lincoln or someone cool, right? Um, but, But this is the longing of the human heart. We all want to know our story. We all want to know our tribe. We all want to uh, know our genealogy. We We all want to be part of a bigger story that's happening. Because who we believe we are actually affects how we live, doesn't it? But oftentimes that discovery leads to drama in our lives. We find out there's that crazy uncle we didn't know about. Uh, We find out we have cousins that all of a sudden want to be a part of our lives when they find out, oh, someone just died and there's an inheritance, right? There's there's always drama with this. And this morning we're going to see Paul take the drama out of the discovery of who we are. Uh, He's been leading up these these first couple chapters of Colossians to, to talk about what our Christian identity is, who we are, and why we should, what we should believe because of that. What does it mean to be in Christ? And as we open up to chapter 3 of Colossians this morning, we're going to see that the, the first four verses sure, uh, serve as this kind of bridge text. It, it, it connects the, the believer's justification and all these things that are true about Christians with this, okay, well, now how should you live? What, what, is, what does sanctification look like for the Christian? And as we um, 
as we see that there's this gap being bridged, uh, we, we can look back and see the nature of the work, the person of Jesus Christ, and we can move then on now to application in our lives. And this is what Paul's doing. Because he's, he's just going to remind us that we're not called to obey in order to be accepted by God. We obey because we've already been accepted by him. Chris talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? And if we mix up this order, then we as Christians are just spinning our wheels, we as Christians are, are trying to earn something really that's already freely been given to us, right? It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so as we dive in Colossians 3, 1 through 11 this morning, we're going to be reminded of our new identity in Christ and the call to live out this reality in our daily lives, okay? So here's our main point for this morning. Through Christ's resurrection... We're given the power to put to death our old way of life and to put on the new self. And as we explore these verses uh, this morning, um, we're going to actively see how we can pursue this new life. First, by setting our minds on the things that are above. Secondly, by uh, 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 putting to death these earthly desires that we have. And third, by taking off the old self and putting on the new. Okay, so let's jump into the first point. The first way we actively pursue this new life in Christ is by setting our minds on things that are above. Verse one says this, if then you've been raised with Christ, let me stop right here for a second. So this if then is a transitional statement, right? Is Paul talking to everyone in the room, if you will? No, he's talking to those who've been raised with Christ, those who've been justified by Christ. This if then statement parallels a few verses earlier, if you just look back a bit, ver, uh, chapter 2, verse 20, where Paul says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world. So Paul is making this link for the Christian, for the believer of our union with Christ. We are united with Christ. Just as Christ has died, we have died. Just as Christ was raised, we have been raised as well. He uses the same lim uh, these, this imagery also in Romans 6. He says, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So the first question that we need to consider when we get to verse 1 of Colossians 3 is, have I been raised with Christ? Consider that question this morning. Because when we say that we've put our faith in Jesus, the reality is that we're no longer bound to this world. We're no longer bound to its desires and its demands. Instead, we're transported, we're, we're kind of sort of catapulted into this spiritual realm where Christ resides. And it's not merely a matter of, oh, I, we just got to accept Jesus in our hearts, right? Like maybe you've heard this term before. Maybe you've, someone said it from the stage before. Accepting Jesus in our hearts. That's not, that's not the problem. We, we are united with him. We are accepted and welcomed into his heart. It's not, hey, Jesus, take the wheel. It's Jesus, Help! I'm, I'm, I'm heading downhill on the top of this mountain. It's a windy road. It's raining. My car's on fire. I'm driving a 1995 Ford Explorer. <laughs> the brakes are out. And there's a cliff at the end. And I'm going to die. And so we hop out of the car. We join Jesus going the opposite direction. Where fullness of life, everlasting joy awaits for us. And I'm sorry, this is a very real illustration for Ford owners. Um, I have a Ford too, so that's... But this is the idea. This is what Christ has done for the Christian, right? And because of this reality that we've been transferred and that we've been delivered and that we've been raised with Christ, because of all that, then Paul will now say in verse 1 how we should live. Ready? Let's continue. Verse 1. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated, at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Now we can talk about all the different interpretations of what Paul, what does Paul mean by the things that are above and all, all this other stuff, but uh, this is an easy Sunday school answer. 
class. What, what, what are the things that are above? Jesus. Jesus is the things that are above, right? It's not this higher spiritual realm. It's not, it's not this sort of enlightenment. So we as Christians, um, Paul's making a distinction here between this present time and this future reality where Christ will rule completely. And so this means as Christians, we live in this state of tension, right? You may feel this of, this, of our present reality, yet this future hope. And this hope is what Paul is drawing the Christians to. Jesus reminds us of the same thing on the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, he says in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So we as Christians, we live by a new set of values. We, we no longer pursue what the world claims to be important. Again, this isn't a withdrawal from our work though, Right? This is, oh, I'm, I'm, just so, I'm just so focused on eternity that I'm going to be a bad husband. I'm so focused only on eternity in Christ that I'm a bad dad or father or employee or a boss. It's not a withdrawal from the work and the activities of the world. You may have heard this quote before. Hopefully it hasn't been said of you. Oh, he's so heavenly minded that he's no earthly good. This is not what Paul wants for the Colossians. This is not what Paul wants for the Christians and Paul points the same reality out in Romans 8, 6. He says, to set the mind on the flesh, here and now, this earth is death. But to set the mind on the spirit, on the things that are above, that's life. That's peace. C.S. Lewis says it this way, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. Neither. It's a matter of priorities for the Christian. What are you seeking first? Are you, are you pursuing getting above giving? Are you pursuing avenging above forgiving? Ruling above serving? Because notice here in verse 1, where's Christ seated? It's so important. Paul says Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, what does that mean? Well, being seated at the right hand of God means that Jesus has been given all authority and honor and, and the highest favor. Jesus sitting at the right hand of, of the Father represents this culmination of all his earthly work. He's now sitting on the throne of heaven. He governs everything for our benefit, having been crucified on our behalf. It means that Jesus is alive. It means that Jesus is sovereign. It means that Jesus is ruling. It means that he's reigning. But do you believe this? Do I? Who sits on the throne of your heart? I mean, practically. I'm not, this isn't, you know, conceptual. This is practically. Who sits on the throne of your heart? When you get the test results back from the doctor and he says, hey, it's cancer. When you get the papers in the mail and your spouse wants a divorce. When your child enters into an unhealthy relationship. Who sits on the throne of your heart? When your property tax bill goes up. Is it a president? A governor? A spouse? A specific brand of medication or treatment? Or is it the risen Christ who has ascended on high on, on this chariot of clouds to sit at his father's right-hand side on the throne of David forever? See, the things above that we should pursue are the things that would honor and glorify Christ here and now. And we can do that in our health. We can do that in our parenting. We can do that in our marriage. We can do that in our jobs and in our relationships. We can do that. You can do it this week. The true spiritual life that we're called to live is this dual reality, right? It's taking this, this blessed assurance that we have of this future hope and applying that to the here and now. Allowing the, king, the power of the kingdom of God to influence and to impact my relationships my, 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 my work life, my parenting, all for the glory of God. 
Paul will then transition in verse 3 to tell us, he's going to tell us, why, well, why should we live this way? Verse 3, he says, for you've died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So in other words, all the things of the, this previous life, those are dead man's things. Don't touch those things. They don't belong to you anymore. In Christ, we can expect victory now because now we finally have the ability to actually obey God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. This is the idea here. I heard this helpful illustration from uh, R.C. Sproul. Um, he compares the Christian life with a chicken being killed. <laughs> okay, So, so I, I didn't do this. I know the junior hires are kind of bummed I didn't bring a chicken to show this to you. But imagine. Imagine I had a chicken on stage with me and I had a butcher's knife and I just chop off the chicken's head. And the head goes rolling that way. And I said, hey, is the chicken dead or alive? Everyone in this room would say, dead, he's dead. Everyone would believe that this chicken is dead. Everyone believes that except the chicken, right? He starts getting up and running around and bouncing into walls. I don't know for how long. I didn't YouTube it. But uh, minutes. And we do the same thing though, right? We bump into walls. We're still pretending that we're alive. But the call of the Christian life is to die to ourselves daily. Those who are truly in Christ can't center on the things of this earth if we've died to them, right? So we as Christians, we've, we've been liberated and we've been freed from this bondage of sin. And Paul says that your life is now hidden in Christ, in God, with Christ in God. So this is a two-part reality, this part where we're being hidden. That firstly, uh, it, it's this idea that things are hidden and concealed in a way, like our lives are hidden and concealed in a way, that people who are not Christians can't recognize it. And so this is what I mean. You go to work and they say, hey, how come you don't cuss? Hey, man, we're having a few drinks uh, after work. Well, why, why don't you ever come drinking with us? Hey, I, I noticed how you talk to your wife on the phone at, Sounds like you have a good marriage. Wait, you're not going to cut that guy back off? He just cut you off in the traffic. Well, we as Christians live differently. And those don't know, who don't know Jesus can't understand why we are so patient with our kids, why we're so loving, right? The, the strength and motivation that we get it doesn't come from a self-help book. It doesn't come from a 12-step program. It doesn't come from Oprah or Dr. Phil or anything like that. It, it, but not only are we hidden with Christ in God in this way, but we're also safe in him. John 10, 28 reminds us that, that he gives us eternal life and that no one can snatch us out of his hand. So even though we walk through very difficult times, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, whatever it may be, whatever that means for you, you can know, we can know that we will fear no evil, evil because we are secure, uh, we're securely hidden in Christ because we've been united to him. In our union with him, we're hidden away. And because of this truth, Paul continues on to say that when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now notice here, it's so interesting. He says, Christ, your life, Christ, our life, right? It's this idea that our personal identity is so tied to the person of Jesus Christ that he's actually now living through us. Paul fleshes this out more in Galatians 2.20 when he says, uh, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. If you've watched uh, the show Ted Lasso, I'm, I haven't seen season three yet, so don't spoil it for me after. I won't spoil anything for you, but if you've seen anything about Ted Lasso, there's this character, Danny Rojas, and Ted meets him. He's the coach. He meets him for the first time. And Danny comes out on the field. He's just super excited. He's like, ah, oh, football is life. Football is life. And he's, he's like an amazing soccer player. And he's, he's just so filled with joy because for him, football is life. That's my best impression. <laughs> um, but for the Christian and what, what Paul would say, he would say, Christ is life. Christ, our life. 
And almost every Sunday, I'll go out into the lobby in between services, and I will either ask this question, or this question will be asked of me, or I'll hear some of you asking each other this question, and what do we say? Hey, man, how's life? And how often do we respond with, oh, well, my kids are life right now. That home renovation is life. My, my work, my job, my school is life. And it's just small talk, right? I mean, it's just small talk. Or could it be an indication of what you're really living for? Because of what Jesus has done for us, we're enabled to set our hearts and minds on the things that are above because Christ is our life. And Paul says that when Christ, who is our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. So Paul says that, hey, we're not just going to merely observe this magnificence of, of Christ's glory like we're sitting in Dodger Stadium and watching something happening. No, we're going to be completely surrounded by it. We're going to be immersed in it. We're going to be active participants in this profound experience when Christ returns. So when Paul says that we will appear with him in glory, he's pointing to the day when Christ will be revealed to the whole world. Now, the second way that we can pursue this new life found in Christ is by putting to death our earthly desires. Let's read verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Notice here Paul's disposition towards sin. Right? He's saying the wrath of God's going to come. And, and what, he's, he, what our attitude should be towards this. He, he doesn't just say, hey, Christian, hey, stay away from that sin. Hey, Christian, don't touch that sin. Hey, Christian, ignore that sin, okay? What, what does Paul say? He says, kill it. Put that sin to death. Execute that sin. Murder your sin. Paul's intention here is to motivate believers to act decisively and ruthlessly about their sin as they go on in their sanctification, as their journey of their sanctification goes on. And as we read this vice list, we can't help but feel some sort of attention. I, I don't know if you felt it. I feel it. First, Paul says that this isn't what Christians should do. And yet, despite our best intentions, we struggle with these inclinations. We struggle with these desires, don't we? And if by some chance you're sitting there this morning, you're like, oh, Chris, but not me. You know, putting to death sin, that's a little harsh. You know, uh, I like to think of it as taming sin. I have this pet sin, and if I just tame it, it's good. It, it'll stay in line. Ask Siegfried and Roy how that worked. Let me remind you of the Apostle John's words, if that's you. 1 John 1, 8, he says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't in us. Sin, Christian, has infiltrated every aspect of our being. It affects our thoughts. It affects our desires. It affects our mind, our attitudes, our actions. We have all in this room fallen short of God's perfect standard. And Look, this acknowledgement, I hope like, I'm not just like on a soapbox this morning. I'm not trying to condemn you. I'm not trying to condemn us. Paul is rather, he's putting us and pointing us to a place of humility that we need to have in our lives of a dependence on God's grace. And part of the grace of God is, uh, for the Christian is the fact that we can battle sin now. As John Owen famously said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. These are the march, that's the marching order for the Christian. We need to take firm and determined measures to ruthlessly eliminate sin in our life. Sam Storms, uh, he speaks of two options that a Christian has, only two, when it comes to battling and dealing with their sin. He says this, you're either reckless or ruthless. There's no middle ground. 
To opt for some third possibility is itself a reckless choice. Either we're ruthless in our commitment and efforts to kill sin, lest it be killing us, or we are reckless by default. We must refuse to make any compromises, to take any captives when it comes to our sin. We must deal with it decisively, without mercy. We must be unrelenting. Are you doing this? Are you on guard against the sin in your life? Have you taken offensive and defensive measures Do you have unfettered access to everything you could ever want here in your pocket? You can listen to whatever you want. You can see whatever you want. Is it on your computer? What apps do you have? Are there, is there anything? Are there any sandbags that you've personally set up in your bunker on your war of sin so that if the enemy shoots at you, you have some defense? Or would they shoot at you and hit something? They're guaranteed to hit something. If the enemy were to storm the castle of your heart, would they come up to the castle and they'd find the drawbridge down? The guards asleep? The archers, oh shoot, I have no arrows. Have you fortified anything in your life? The call in the Christian life is to be ruthless against their sin. And let me tell you, this is only possible because of one word that we see in verse 5. And the word is therefore. Right? The command to kill our sin is only possible because of our union with Christ. So as we work through this list that Paul provides, that we just read, the things that we should be killing, I want us to consider three principles that's going to help us to put to death what is earthly in us, okay? I'm adapting these points from J.C. Ryle. So, uh, so to put death to sin, we first need to realize that true Christianity is a fight. It's this realization of knowing where there's grace in our lives, there, there's going to be conflict. There's no holiness for the Christian without warfare in their lives. As D.A. Carson has pointed out, None of us drift towards holiness. This is a battle. It's fought day to day. It's fought hour to hour. The enemy never sleeps. The enemy never slumbers. The enemy never goes on vacation, takes a siesta. The Bible says that Satan roams around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. James 4, 4, the apostle reminds us, he says this, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do you view your relationship to sin in this way? Or is it, oh, that's just a pet sin. That, Chris, that's a respectable sin. James is not saying that when you sin, man, God just kind of crosses his arms and he pouts and he's upset that you made a mistake and and your consequence is now enmity. He's saying that if you claim to be a Christian who's united to Jesus Christ, how can you trifle with the very sin that crucified your best friend and savior? Is there any areas where you're compromising your allegiance to Jesus? As we look at verses 5 and 6, we're going to look at this list. Notice what we're supposed to put to death specifically. Paul says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, which is covet- uh, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On the account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Now, this, this isn't an, an exhaustive vice list, is it? But the question I want us to consider is this. Do you experience any conflict in your heart when it comes to reading this list? Can you think to personal battles that you've fought and won or it was close or is there any conflict happening? Because Paul will give us another list in Galatians 5, right? The fruit of the spirit, verse 22 and 23. And he holds this list 
up next to, if we take this list and we hold it up to Colossians, we're going to see that the fruit of the Spirit is literally the opposite of everything that we see here in this vice list, right? And what's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. See how the fruit of the Spirit is literally opposing everything that is earthly within us. Love, joy, and peace opposes evil desire, anger, wrath, and malice. Patience, kindness, and goodness, that opposes slander and obscene talk. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, it opposes sexual immorality, impurity, and passion. And do you recognize the presence of these things in your life vying for control? Because Paul picks up on this tension for the Christian, and I love that Paul does this in Romans. He shares from his personal experience. And he says this in Romans 7, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I find in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and holding me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Can you sense a battle like this happening within your inner being? True Christianity is a fight. And we first need to acknowledge that there's a battle happening. And if you feel this tension, you've felt this tension in the past of this battle happening within your heart, I hope you know that that's the grace of God working in you. God to give you a conscience and to give you desires that are contrary to what your flesh would want to do. But maybe you look at this vice list in Colossians and you say, Chris, be honest. I I think the enemy has strongholds in all of those areas of my life, if not most of them. I don't sense any battle. I don't sense any conflict raging at all. And I would just say to you, hey, you need to return back to Colossians 3.1. You need to ask yourself, have I been raised with Christ? Because... Otherwise, it's impossible for you. It's impossible for anyone to put to death sin in their life without that being a reality for them. And secondly, we see that in order to put sin to death, we need to realize that true Christianity is a fight of faith. So the Christian, for the rest of our lives, I'm sorry, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm bumming you out here, but for the rest of our lives, we're going to be involved in a lifelong struggle to uphold our beliefs. See, because ideas and, and fads and deconstruction podcasts and, and all these things are going to come and go, but the Christian's faith is the very backbone of our defense. The Bible calls it the shield of faith because without it, we could not block the flaming arrows of the evil one. J.C. Ryle says this, would anyone live the life of a Christian soldier? Let him pray for faith. It's the gift of God and a gift of those who ask shall never ask for in vain. You must believe before you fight. If men do nothing in religion, it's because they do not believe. Faith is the first step towards heaven. Faith is of the utmost importance for for the Christian who's looking to kill sin in their life. The writer of Hebrews reminds us, right? What does he say? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is so important in our battle. Paul reminds us to seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This isn't just some one and done type of deal. This is a daily exercise, a daily fight of faith. The apostle John picks up on this importance when he he says in 1 John 3, 3, he says, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So all those who who hope in him, who who have faith in Jesus, they purify themselves. They get ready for the battle. And looking at the vice list here in verse 5, the Christian can fight against sexual immorality by having the faith to follow God's design for sexuality and to rely on the Holy Spirit to resist these temptations of sexual sin, to to seek relationships that don't honor God. 
A Christian can put off impurity and lust by realizing first that impurity begins in the heart and mind. This is the condition of, of, this is the human condition. We're full of sin. But because impurity already dwells within us, we must pray in faith, asking God to lead us away from temptation and knowing that as 1 John 5.14 says, that, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We can put away evil desires. We can put away greed through the faith that we have in God's provision and in his, in his providence for us, right? Knowing that God will cultivate in us contentment when we pursue generosity over greed. Christianity is a fight of faith because we know that the reality of sin can make us jaded. We're all going to leave here today. We're going to get a phone call. We're going to see something on Instagram. We're going to hear something from a coworker or a boss. And sin just jades us, doesn't it? Sin clouds our judgment. It dulls our spiritual senses. It, it erodes our, our trust that we should have in God and in his goodness and in his faithfulness. And in these moments, it, it's important for the Christian to recognize the deceptive um, deceptiveness of sin, but at the same time utilizing this powerful tool that we have of our faith in, in belief of what Jesus has done for us to battle against us, to be, battle against it. And thirdly, we see that in order to put to death sin, we need to understand that true Christianity is a good fight. The Christian fight is good because it's a war after your soul. It's the most important thing. You cannot put a price tag on that. Verse 6 reminds us that the wrath of God is coming after all those earthly things that Paul reminded us of. And, and this is going to be unlike any other battle we've seen. Now, when you think of American history for a second, maybe if we took a poll in the room and, and looked at American history, we maybe might agree on a handful of battles that America's been a part of that we would say, oh, you know, th those were worth the sacrifice. Maybe a handful. Even though these battles were fought valiantly, even though the, there's these needless deaths, there's bad leadership along the way, there were innocents caught in the crossfire, there's errors made along the way. How many times have we seen this kind of portrayed on the enemy's side in movies? I think of uh, the movie Pearl Harbor, right? Uh, there's this scene where we get a glimpse of the Japanese soldier. He's in, his, he's in his airplane. He's about to drive it straight into the side of a ship. But what is he looking at while he's doing this? His family. There's a little portrait of his family. They have a life too. We can never really say that every single person on America's enemy line only ever cared about the mission, only ever cared about the destruction of America. They had their doubts. They had orders they didn't agree with. They had conflicting thoughts. But the spiritual battle is so much different. The Christian's battle is different. There's nothing redeeming about our enemy. Our enemy, our sin, wants our demise and our destruction. Paul's language in verse 7 and 8 is interesting, right? He's, it's, it's this once but, but now reality. He says in verse 7, In these two you once walked, past tense. And then in verse 8, But now you must put them all away. Why should we put these away, Paul? Because the enemy is ruthless. The enemy has no other desire except for the destruction of all those who'd claim to be a child of the king. Your enemy is plotting your every stumble, your every slip up. They're looking for ground to gain in your life. They're merciless to plant their flag. When it comes to the Christian life, every battle that we fight against the enemy is a good fight. Every casualty from the enemy line shouldn't be mourning. It should be a celebration. We can trust that the general of our salvation will never fail to bring us to victory, right? We have, 
How many times have you seen in, in, in uh, military movies, right? They're, they're pinned in. They're calling for support. Sorry, won't be there in 10 minutes. Not true with the Christian. We have unlimited artillery, unlimited support, unlimited uh, backup from the Holy Spirit who helps us in our weaknesses, who searches our hearts, who intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Because of this support in the Spirit, we can now put off these sins that Paul mentions that focus on our emotions and speech. So as we get to verse uh, 8 and 9, he says this, But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices. So for the Christian, instead of anger and wrath, the Christian can practice self-control and patience by remembering that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And remembering that God was long-suffering with us and that he loved us and that he forgave us. Instead of malice and slander, the Christian can seek to love others and cultivate this heart of compassion for one another. We could choose to build up the body of Christ rather than tear it down. It's really hard to talk about about someone behind their back when you're serving them face to face, isn't it? Instead of obscene talk and lying, the Christian with gratitude and reverence can listen to and share about the goodness of God. When we allow the word of God, this right here, when we allow this to shape our, our mind and our thoughts and we read this and we, we just soak it in, we, we meditate on its truth because it's not merely just a book with, with just words in it. It's this divine stimulant that renews our mind and that sanctifies our speech. And ultimately, the Christian fight is good because there's a great reward at the end. <sighs> Better than any spoils, any riches of any soldier went out to get ever in human history better than any medals or titles or purple hearts or accolades for the Christian as first Peter four says, there is an unfading crown of glory laid up for all of those who fight hard and fight to the end. Now, lastly, the final way that we can actively pursue this new life that we have in Christ is by taking off the old self and putting on the new. Paul says in verse 9 and 10, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So the vice list that Paul just, just went through, right? Those are all the things that those who are in Christ should be putting off. We need to get rid of those. We need to discard those because we've died with Christ, right? And we should, and we can now do that. We can pursue holiness in our lives. The Christian can put off the, the old self and, 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 and discard all that was earthly in us because we've been transformed. We're new creations. And it's our responsibility every day, Christian, to, to put on that new identity, to remind ourselves that we are in Christ. Peter O'Brien, he explains what the Colossians have put off and have, what they've put on, and the same goes for us. He says, just as the old man is what, what they once were in Adam, the embodiment of regenerate, unregenerate humanity, so the new man is what they now are in Christ, the embodiment of the new humanity. Christ is the new man whom the Colossians have put on. He's the second Adam. He's the head of the new creation. We sang about this just a couple minutes ago, right? The true and better Adam. This is what Christ has done. So we need to let go of our former way of living. Even when it tries to infiltrate. Even when it tries to exert its influence. Because I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to live the rest of our lives as Christians in tension of what we have already become in Christ and what we are still becoming. It's this 
already but not yet reality. So our task is not merely to eliminate sin, but it's actually to discard it, to remove it completely. Imagine a NASCAR driver who just crashed his car. It's in flames and he's covered in gasoline. He's going to hop out of that car and what's he going to do? He's stripping everything off. This is what we need to do. We need to put to death and cast it aside. And in verse 12 through 17, Paul will talk in more detail about what we should be uh, putting on as Christians. And I won't get into that part of the text, but I hope you'll join us next week when we talk about what we should be putting on. But I do want to end by looking at Paul's final words in verse 11. He says here, really quick, so here is connecting with our identity being found in our creator, right? Paul's saying here in that truth, there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So Paul ends here by reminding us that, that Christ is everything that matters. Christ is life, right? It doesn't, our distinctions of ethnicity and culture and sexuality, our, our social status, they hold no bearing no weight or significance with this spiritual relationship we now have with God. But the world attempts to define us by these differences, right? By these labels. The world tries to cause division and conflict with these things. Are you Republican or Democrat? Are you vaxxed or unvaxxed? Are you gun rights or gun control? Are you black lives matter? Are you blue lives matter? Are you homeschool or are you public school? This is what the world right, wants right now, to put us in a category, to, to give us these polarizing labels that separate and that divide the church. And what Paul is saying here is that that Christ should be our greatest concern. Christ should be our greatest pursuit. Christ should be our identity. Christ should be everything. All individuals are now regarded as brothers and sisters in Christ, who's our big brother because of our union with him. We're called to look above these worldly divisions and, and not waste our time in these things and embrace the shared identity that we have in Jesus. This is the Jesus that we worship. This Jesus is our life. Is he your life? Because the Christian has died, because of what Christ has died, because the Christian is raised, because Christ was raised, we've been given power to put to death this old way of life. We can now seek the things that are above. We can now look to uh, put to death our earthly desires and we can take off the old self and we can put on the new self. In, in Romans 7, Paul comes to this conclusion. He says, after saying all these things, he says, man, Wretched man am I. Wretched man I am. And then he asks this question, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he says, thanks be to Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's only because Christ is life that we have new life. Let me pray. God, I thank you for your son, for sending him. Lord, even though we were sinners, that he died for us and he, he has now adopted us into his family. Lord, we are, we are given the status and the title of brother and sister because we are united with Jesus. And God, I thank you that because of this, we can now put to death what is earthly in us. Because of this, we can seek the things that are above, allowing those things to impact our relationships, our daily lives, and everything's going on here and now. God, because Christ is our life, we can discard our old way of living and put on the new man, your son, Jesus. 
I pray that you would help us to do that this week in our homes, in our workplaces, in our relationships, God. Help us to battle sin. Help us to fight the good fight. It's only by your power that we can do this. In Jesus' name, amen.